Grace, probably more than anything else, puts us at a, an extreme disadvantage because we always like to think that there is in us something good and something redeemable. Every one of us that have been saved for any period of time often think that God saved us for a reason, and so because of that reason, that's why we're saved. Well, the truth is, no, it's not. You were saved by grace. Because there isn't a reason for your salvation. There is a purpose for your salvation, and that is to reveal Jesus. It has nothing to do with you. If you could have added anything by being saved, then God would not have saved you. If there was anything particularly special or unique about you, God would not have saved you. Because the reality is, is that God, out of his love, demonstrates his love for you by saving you because of his mercy and grace not because there's something in you that's good. You see, there's always that effort within ourselves to try to make ourselves to be something more than what we are, which is sinner. We cannot earn or add to the work that God has done. God is the one who is accomplishing it. When you like to look at yourself and think that you're good, you've already failed the test because the reality is God has already determined and placed a verdict upon everything that you could possibly do for yourself before the foundations of the world were even made. He knew everything that you could have possibly thought of, done, or the attitudes that you have. And he found them guilty of sin. You see, you're not perfect, no matter how good you think you are. And that's the one thing that man always wants to do. He wants to make himself good. He wants to find in himself some kind of reality check that says, well, Babies are innocent, aren't they? No, they're not. They're guilty of sin, as much as you are. And every one of us have that verdict, because babies are corrupt. They're born corruption. If you wanted to treat sin as a new word, call it corruption, and it makes more sense sometimes, because then you begin to understand, well, if you're already corrupted, then you need to become perfect. So if your corruption needs to put on incorruption, then something has to change. And that's what God does through grace. If you think you are a very pure person and yet are not washed from your filthiness, righteousness has evaded you. The Bible says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. From 1 John 1 and 8 and 10. Scripture states our problem clearly. All the world stands guilty before God. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 19 and 23. Whenever we try to establish our righteousness by keeping rules, eventually we are forced to admit we operate on a sliding scale. I will always look morally better to myself than I do to you. And you will always look morally worse to me than you do to yourself. I can look at your life and see all kinds of flaws, but when I look at myself, the few flaws I don't notice don't seem so bad. Even the righteousness I can achieve by what I do is only a sham righteousness. The Bible declares we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. Isaiah 64, 6. The interesting thing about that is that whenever we discuss grace is that there's always that aspect where people think that because grace has been given, now that we have it, now we can do righteousness and we're righteous. No, you're not. You're still a sinner. You're still sinning. You're still not measuring up. Because God is the one who has to impute that righteousness. He has to be the one to give it to you. He has to be the one to say, yeah, by grace you're saved. I saved you because of what my son has done, not because of what you have done, because as far as I'm concerned, you're guilty. And that's God's verdict on you and I. The reality of grace, when you begin to understand it completely, predicates itself upon the idea that, first of all, we all are guilty. Not one person, whether young, old, new, past, present, or future, is righteous. All is all. And all have sinned. And all have been determined guilty before God. Before a holy, perfect God, that imperfection that you are, that corruption that you have become, that guiltiness that you have as being a sinner, born in sin and conceived in sin, 
is already determined to go into the lake of fire. You're already heading that direction. You have to try to stop yourself from going there, and you can't. There's nothing you can do to prevent that. That's going to happen, irregardless of what you do. But what God does is he says, I have a way to prevent you from being annihilated and in eternal torment if you'll accept it. But it's going to cost me dearly. It will cost me my son. So in grace, we find ourselves at the mercy of God because we can't do anything except make a choice. And that choice is to accept God's mercy and grace for us by the death and resurrection of his only begotten son. Once you've made that choice, then you have to make and determine to follow the actions of that choice that God has given us the criteria to do, which is to accept, to follow, and to believe in Him. So, in some ways, there is some things that you can do in making a choice to not be eternally damned. But once that choice is made, then you're either obedient or disobedient and find yourself under God's criteria and not your own. That's why it is of grace that we are saved, and that not of ourselves, lest any man should boast, because there's nothing we can boast about. We can give thanks for what God has done, which is His grace.